I would like to start my presentation welcoming the audience that is joining us today, sharing and learning about the most innovative practices that are changing the world for the better for persons with disabilities around the world. My name is Carola Rubia and I am the Executive Director of Fundación Descubreme. I have white tan skin with long brown hair and I'm wearing a blue jacket. I'm very grateful to be joining the CETO Project Conference on Inclusive Employment and ICT, a topic that is very close to our hearts in Fundación Descubreme. Fundación Descubreme is turning 11 years old this year. During this period, we have focused our efforts on promoting the full inclusion of people with cognitive disabilities in all areas of human development in Chile. 11 years ago, inclusion was not a topic that organizations and companies talk about in our country. And as you can imagine, very few people with disabilities accessed the open labor market. The figure was even lower for persons with cognitive disabilities. Since then, we have concentrated our job in promoting the access of people with cognitive disabilities for inclusive and reasonable employment. It is a task that we continue developing with enthusiastic and dedication. However, our work show us that one of the main problems people with disability face, it is why they are searching for jobs due its lack of education and training for employment. Therefore, since 2019, we have been working on inclusive education with the aim to support the educational system in Chile, bringing successful international experiences that can be replicated in our local context. These 11 years of life have shown us how much we have advanced in our mission, but we cannot deny the many barriers that we still need to overcome to achieve the full inclusion of people with disabilities in Chile and around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic made us questioning what we knew about education, employment and inclusion. COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound effect in the global economy and labor market around the world. We have seen unprecedented changes in employment. Firstly, a significant increase in the employment rates due to the closure of businesses. Secondly, financial problems within the transportation services and manufacturing industries. And thirdly, many companies, workers and employees are now using the options available for technology adapted to due to this uh, new content. In this scenario, it is important to consider that many persons with disabilities already came into this crisis, facing a significant gap in their employment participation in comparison to the rest of the population. As we know, people with disabilities are less likely to have a job, and when they are employed, their work conditions tend to be worse than those of persons without disabilities. Also, Many persons with disabilities work in the informal economy, which means that they experience less labor stability and may not have access to work benefits. These gaps are the result of many barriers present within the educational system, in the business sector and in the accessibility of the environment, among others. Taking this into account, it is crucial that an inclusive response to the COVID-19 pandemic includes measures that promote employment and work opportunity for persons with disability. For these measures to be successful, we must consider the changes that the pandemic has brought to our daily lives and the major trends that will shape the labor market in the future. As I just mentioned, COVID-19 has changed almost every aspect of our lives, including the way we work. Now, more than ever, we are seeing companies and organizations using technology alternatives to provide employees support in their work. These 
changes are only possible thanks to the technological advances produced in the context of the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. The fourth industri industrial revolution is defined as the merging of various technology such as artificial intelligence, robotics, big data, the Internet of Things, nanotechnology, among others. One of the main characteristics of these technologies is they can collect huge data sets and make decisions about process with little or even no human intervention. As you can imagine, these technologies have also erupted in the labor market. In fact, they are rapidly changing the type of jobs available for people and the kind of skills employers require. The magnitude of these changes is another thing altogether. Some experts believe that about 50% of our current job positions will disappear in the following decades. The reason behind this is that these technologies can automate a diverse range of tasks that nowadays are performed by people. Therefore, we are already seeing a decrease in the demand of low skill or manual work. Likewise, we are also seeing an increase in the need of high qualified employees that can operate in a technological environment. Because of these skills such as critical thinking, analytical capacity and emotional intelligence are becoming increasingly important to achieve a competitive job position. Therefore, the crisis produced by COVID-19, global pandemic, and the major trends that will shape the labor market in the next years, we have the challenge to continue promoting the employment of persons with disability to ensure that no one is left behind. You may be wondering how we can face this challenge. I would like to share our training program that we have developed in Fundación Descubreme to become, to become this scenario. Our respond to the pandemic was through a series of online training courses for persons with cognitive disabilities. These courses lasted 34 days and aimed to develop the main skills with a training process as an additional support. One of the main elements that allowed the success of this initiative is that we provide the technological elements to work online. Each student receives a tablet and a mobile internet connection. This is combined by constant support on how to use the platform in which the lessons were taught and information about each application to complete the course. In this way, we're not only addressing the education gap of persons with disability, but we're also preparing them to respond to the present and the future demands of the labor market. This will enhance their employability and ensure that they have the tools to adapt to the changes that may come. How we see the future of employment in these rapidly changed scenarios? How we can continue building an inclusive labor market for persons with disabilities and thus ensure that no one is left behind? I would like to make some fi final remarks before ending my presentation. We have seen this pandemic has brought us many challenges, such as the way in which we relate to one in another and the way we work. It has also brought to our attention that investing inclusion is needed now more than ever because some barriers have increased. In the coming years, we are also expect that technology and the fourth industrial revolution transform the labor market, changing the type of jobs and skill that will be required. Taking all these elements into consideration, there is one thing that comes to my mind. We ha have now a precious opportunity to be flexible, to be active and to adapt to a new and alternative way of working all the above under an inclusive environment. Therefore, it is crucial to identify 
this change and to establish a roadmap to promote the inclusive employment of people with disabilities in the future to come. One possible roadmap to tackle this challenge is to develop training programs for persons with disabilities adapted to this new content. These programs should focus on providing them with the skills and technology competencies that will be required to obtain a job in the open labor market soon. To implement this kind of initiatives, firstly, we need all actors in the employment ecosystem, including companies, NGO, educational institutions and government, are committed to respond in an inclusive manner. Secondly, we need permanent learning. As we have shown, our world is changing at a pace we had never seen before. Employees need to be adapting their knowledge constantly and acquiring new technological competencies competencies to respond to these dynamic requirements. And thirdly, we need social investment. This initiative has a high positive impact in the life of persons with disabilities, so it is crucial that different stakeholders can invest in them. The technological advances evidenced by the fourth industrial revolution and the adversities of the pandemic have shown us that our work should be focused on developing the tools so people with disability are not left behind. Using this technology will also help us prepare ourselves to respond better to those adversities and be part of the digital transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carola. And uh, now Carola is also live with us. Uh, hello, Carola. Hi, Michael, how are you? Fine. Um, Carol, thank you for so much for this inspiring uh, speech. Uh, I would like to ask you one question uh, targeting towards the, the work of Fundación Descubreme itself. You, uh, maybe you elaborate a little that uh, Fundación Descubreme is also a force, uh, maybe even a major force in, uh, in Chile that helps br uh, bring this change uh, to Chile and, and to other countries in Latin America that you just uh, put into big vision. So maybe you point out some three, four uh, main projects of Fundación Descubreme uh, that work towards a more inclusive uh, uh, employment, uh, world of employment. Uh, we are just one, an NGO, as well as many that you can find uh, in Chile, um, and also fr uh, from the Latin America and Spanish speaker community. However, um, we do believe that uh, partnership and alliances are crucial uh, in order to bring to our countries uh, best practices that can be replicated and also implemented uh, in, in Chile. Um, this, this partnership and this, this alliance uh, has allowed us to, to, uh, not, uh, to face problems like the COVID-19 that we had, uh, that we started last last year, uh, it was uh, so nice and easy to pick up the phone and give a call to different organizations in the U.S., in Austria, uh, in Mexico, in Argentina, um, to un uh, on uh, on Spain to understand what they were doing uh, regarding uh, how they were thinking and facing. Uh, um, pandemic like uh, uh, COVID-19, and um, I do believe that uh, that's probably one of the, the most important things of thinking how you should develop your strategy in order to be successful, in order to be able to make the change that you're looking for. Secondly, uh, is to be, as, as I said in my presentation, uh, we must be uh, active adaptable, flexible, because um, techno technology was not part of what we were doing in our day-to-day. -day. And uh, what we face uh, through the pandemic, uh, uh, we were obliged to be part of the technology uh, wave 
otherwise we were going to be out and the people that we were helping and giving some support who was the people with cognitive disability, they will be unable to uh, be part of the labor market. Uh, so definitely we changed the way we were uh, doing business. We changed the way we were training people. That We changed the way that we were bringing support to the companies. We changed uh, the way we were looking things, finally. And I do believe that today we have a wonderful uh, online training courses, not only for people with cognitive disabilities, but also for their families. Uh, the good thing is that uh, you, are, you have a student um, working from or studying from home, but also the mother, the father, the daughter, the sister, everyone in the family was part of uh, that process. So that was something really, really interesting. And um, the, the last thing I would say that uh, is something very important uh, is Pacto. You, you, Michael, you know Pacto Productiva. Uh, it, it is a, a, a program that uh, it was developed in Colombia, uh, uh, supported by Fundación Corona and also uh, for the ID, IDV Lab. And it was an initiative that it was very interesting to bring to our country, to Chile. And um, I'll be glad if anyone all over the world would like to know more in details about Pacto Productiva because it's something that uh, it helps to bring everyone involved in inclu inclusion uh, all together. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, after four years, uh, we are very pleased. We, we are seeing the first results uh, of uh, what happened when private sector, public sector, NGOs, people with disabilities, everyone works together and, and uh, searching and and wishing and developing finally an uh, inclusive uh, community. Thank you, Carola. Um, so you talked about partnerships and that's uh, why I also want to put some uh, light on the partnership that Fundacion Descubrime has with the Esla Foundation. So I also brought my founder and my boss, uh, Martin Esla, with me here uh, for this conversation. So for some two years now, we are uh, working together on the Zero Project. Uh, we have defined some areas of cooperation. There is the Zero Project Latin America Conference. There is the report, Zero Project report, that's also published uh, in Spanish language. Uh, and there is um, a lot more. Uh, and Martin, uh, maybe you come in first and uh, put some light from your point of view on about the cooperation with Fundacion Descubrame, how it works, um, what we see for the future, and uh, some personal impressions on that. And Carol, then I will ask you the same question. Yes, uh, uh, I'm so happy to uh, announce and to inform uh, the community uh, that the partnership with uh, Fondation Descoupreme is uh, really fruitful thanks to Catalina Salé and uh, uh, Carolina Rubia and her fantastic and engaged team. Uh, I think the um, reason of this uh, success from the very beginning is that uh, we have the same targets. We do want to design a society without barriers, a society for all. And this is our dream. And we are coming from different parts of the world and bringing in different talents. Um, like in a family or a, a big uh, network, it's the, absolutely the same. And therefore, in uh, getting together and uh, becoming a strategic partnership, we found out that the innovative practices and policies from Latin America, we uh, almost uh, had nothing uh, in the past, uh, came to us and we could uh, um, uh, present them. And on the other hand, to know there is a strategic partner who will implement innovations, uh, it is amazing uh, how a Zero Project could be strengths, uh, receive strengths, uh, more strengths, and to be much more impactful than in the future. And my goal is to learn from each other 
and to find out whether it wouldn't be interesting finding uh, uh, additional partnerships with persons from other parts of the world so that we can even uh, be more productive uh, in that way. And thank you so much, uh, Carola, for this uh, beautiful uh, cooperation uh, and uh, the trust we have uh, on each other. And uh, I'm also very proud that the Zero Project Almanac will be uh, produced also in your mother tongue, in Spanish, so that we can cover much more persons uh, than before and friends from our network. Thank you, Martin. So, Carola, you want hopefully to add some, um, uh, some uh, flavor and emotion and information from your side on this, uh, on this good cooperation between the, our two foundations. Uh, I mean, Martin has said almost everything, but I would like to add that uh, for Descubreme was searching for a partner uh, for, for a couple of years. And when we had the chance to see what you have done in Zero Project uh, the year 2017, uh, in which we were an award D uh, for an inclusion program uh, done here in Chile, uh, we were able to see not only the kind of uh, organization you are, which is a professional, kind, open, and also uh, thinking how what else we can be can be done. Um, we also saw that uh, Zero Project and our cooperation was a space in which we, as a discoverer, we were able to provide uh, some support. Yes. And that was the Spanish community, uh, a huge market, uh, probably 8 million or, or, or much more uh, uh, number of people. And uh, the, the good thing is that um, because we, 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 we thought that the, the best thing to do was to learn from you, yeah. you were just saying, Martin, uh, we, want, we would like to learn from you. I'm telling you the same thing. We, what we thought at the beginning was to learn from you. That's why we spent a lot of time the first year in, in Vienna, in Austria, uh, learning the way you were working, uh, learning what was your objective. And we realized that we have a lot of uh, in common. And uh, it was a good opportunity to um, bring more of what is needed uh, uh, to develop a world without barriers. Uh, we, we are very, very pleased of what we have achieved so far. Uh, we are also very pleased that uh, we can contribute with the version in Spanish of the Almanac and also uh, for the Zero uh, Project uh, Inclusion Labor uh, Report. And uh, I mean, we are more than grateful of, of, for you uh, to say that we, we are your partners, because definitely we believe that we are the ones uh, learning from you rather than you are learning from us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Be, be assured that it works both ways. So we learn a lot from you as well. <laughs> Thank you, Carola, for coming in. Thank you, Martin, for joining. Um, we are closing now this part of the, uh, of the Keynote R with Keynote 1, moving on to Keynote 2. Carola, you, you stay with us uh, remotely and come in as an expert in the, after the, the Keynote of uh, uh, Miss Laurie Henneborn. So I, I'm moving on and will now introduce our next Keynote speaker. Laurie Henneborn is um, uh, an Accenture Research Managing Director, so Accenture, the international consulting company who leads re research and is a thought leader uh, when it comes to developing uh, disability inclusive uh, workspaces. And uh, Laura Henneborn, Henneborn and colleagues have also produced a, a current uh, major research report on uh, inclusion, disability inclusion of, of large companies around the world. So uh, welcome, Laurie, and we will start uh, with uh, the pre-recorded session, and then you come in live and have a conversation with, with me and Carola Rubia. Hello, everyone from New York. My name is Laurie Henneborn, and I'm thrilled to be joining you all during this incredible event today. I'm a managing director at Accenture, a leading global professional services firm. And I lead research and thought leadership development focused on raising awareness and taking action 
pertaining to disability inclusion and equality in the workplace. To that end, I led the research for the study you'll hear about in this session, and also for a 2018 study called Getting to Equal Disability Inclusion Advantage Study, which was a collaborative effort to shape the business case for disability inclusion. This was between Accenture, Disability In, and the American Association of People with Disabilities, or AAPD. I'm on the board of directors for AAPD, but I also sit on the Disability Inclusion Advisory Council here at Accenture. And I think finally, what I would say is that I'm especially passionate about coaching and mentoring colleagues with invisible disabilities, drawing from my own experience since being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2004. Before we dive into the details of this study, we'll be, take, we'll be talking about today, I'd like to share a brief video which showcases some colleagues of mine and the amazing work that they're delivering for Accenture and our clients. Listen. I was part of a team who developed scalable training to help clients transition from legacy systems into new enterprise solutions. I have been working in Accenture at nine years. I work as a functional analyst. I was part of a procurement team that realized a 50% savings target for our oil and gas client. That I had the opportunity to work for a community-based clinic for executing a new electronic health record system. I was a part of a team who delivered a scalable, future-ready service delivery model. So the study you'll be hearing about today was possible due to a truly multifaceted survey of 30,000 employees from almost 30 countries conducted in 2019. From this survey, we've been able to release our Getting to Equal report earlier in 2020, focused on gender equality, and now with results from 6,000 employees and nearly 700 executives with disabilities, we published this study focused on the important role that culture plays for disability inclusion in the workplace, titled Enabling Change, which we launched in time for International Day of Persons with Disabilities in December 2020. Ultimately, all of this powerful content and thought leadership aims to illustrate Accenture's deep passion, commitment, and position on inclusion and diversity in its broadest sense, while delivering an understanding of tangible actions that our clients can take to advance along their own journeys. Let's take a look at the key findings. First, it's important to ground the research in the scale of disability and how employment is trending around the world, but this is not a niche issue. Persons with disabilities represent about 15%, that's 1 billion in the world's population. And important not to forget, 80% of disabilities emerge when people are of working age. Meaning any of us could acquire a disability at any time. It's not a matter of them, but a matter of all of us, so not a niche issue. And their participation in the workforce is disproportionately low. It's estimated that across the world, close to 80% of persons with disabilities are not employed. In most developed countries, the, own, the official unemployment rate for persons with disabilities of working age is at least twice that of those who have no disability. But what about those employees with disabilities who are in the workforce? Are they confident in their roles and in the contributions they're making? Are they feeling supported? Are they thriving? And is the culture of the organization in which they work enabling a more diverse, inclusive workforce overall? Well, our research suggests that in fact, we are at risk of seeing wasted talent among this community of aspirational employee, employees who want to. They do love their jobs. We love working. But they're more likely by one and a half times or just over 60% more likely to feel excluded in the workforce and they lack a sense of achievement, a sense of confidence in terms of the contributions that they're making. In fact, what you see here in the top purple bars on the right is that employees with disabilities are 27% less likely to feel included in the workplace compared with the average. And by included, we mean they feel like a key component of their team with real influence over decisions. By excluded, we mean ignored or with no voice in their team. 
So bottom line, employees with disabilities are less likely to feel included and more likely to feel excluded. So yes, change is needed. But our research revealed that achieving real meaningful change is hampered by two things. First is the lack of transparency and trust, where we have strong evidence that a vast majority of employees and leaders alike, 77 and 80%, respectively, are not disclosing their disabilities at work. I was one of them. I didn't disclose until 13 years after I was diagnosed. And second is the lack of urgency to change, which is likely driven by the gap we uncovered in how supportive leaders believe their culture is versus what the employees actually experience. In fact, we asked executives and employees alike about whether they feel the workplace they operate in enables employees with disabilities to thrive in terms of having the right tech, environment, and support. 67% of executives say, yes, this is what we do. But that drops to just 41% of employees who agree. And taking this further, a mere 20% of the employees that we surveyed feel their organization is fully committed to helping them to advance and thrive. That's a lot of room for improvement. So that's the context for what our survey tells us about the situation in the workplace, what executives perceive and what employees experience. But we wanted to take it further. We wanted to unearth the lessons to be learned from those environments in which employees with disabilities are thriving. So we focused on responses from the almost 6,000 employees with disabilities to assess their levels of human potential or engagement in the workplace. And when we talk about human potential, what we really mean in the study is around two things. One is around their career, satisfaction, and what they aspire to do going forward. Do they aspire to senior leadership and that sort of thing? And the second is their sense of confidence and belonging. Their ability to give their best to the organization. Are they comfortable raising issues, asking questions, being open about who they are and what they want to do? The freedom, do they have the freedom to in innovate? Um, these sorts of things. And we took that sense of employee potential and set that against 200 workplace culture factors, mapping one against the other. The idea of this is to say which factors which characteristics of the workplace culture have a significant and positive effect on employee potential? And what this allowed us to do is identify those factors which positively and significantly influence thriving among employees with disabilities. Once we had those in place, we were able to also identify the workplaces at the very top or our top 10% where these key workplace factors were most common. And we refer to these as the more equal cultures. And these are the eight factors which our model shows have a positive and significant impact on the likelihood of an employee with a disability to thrive in the workplace. Remember by thriving, we mean their career satisfaction, and aspirations, and their sense of confidence and belonging. Now there's no sense of causality here that putting these factors in place will absolutely lead to more employees thriving. But our, what our model suggests and what it does is it shows the likelihood of these factors being present in an organization where these individuals are thriving. And our study reveals examples also of companies globally which stand out for the, each of these factors, such as Accenture's own Thriving Minds program created in partnership with Stanford Medicine and Thrive Global to focus on better understanding the impact of stress and the steps that we can all take to build resiliency. And I personally love the lemon trees example where this hotel chain in India, which has rigorous and comprehensive training program in place for employees, you know, all new recruits must take an introductory sign language class in order to communicate with their non-hearing colleagues and customers. Now, you will have noticed that the eight factors are quite general. They're not obviously disability specific at face value. But we know there's an important layer over the top of these factors to maximize the likelihood of employees with disabilities thriving in the workplace. And we talked about some of these in our past report um, titled the Disability Inclusion Advantage, and these included accessibility and workplace accommodations. The contrast with our research, how this fits into our research, is that we sought um, 
to uncover some less obvious factors. So what else is there? What are the other things that work for one group and can work for others? And this is important that we pinpoint factors that ultimately help everyone. Because we know from the global interviews we conducted for this study that many employees with disabilities do not want to be singled out for, sing for special treatment. They simply want a level playing field so they can thrive at the same pace as their peers. So the final piece we wanted to address, of course, is around what employees with disabilities stand to gain and what an organization stands to gain when these eight factors are in place. In terms of the employee, we see major differences to engagement. If we compare the best workplaces or the top 10% where these eight factors are most common with the worst workplaces, and that would be the bottom 10%. And yes, employees with disabilities are thriving in some companies. For example, if all companies had cultures that were as equal as the top 10%, the likelihood of an employee being and feeling engaged would be up to one and a half times higher. And you can see here two other related areas where we break that down into stronger career satisfaction and aspirations and a higher sense of confidence and belonging. And in terms of the commercial benefits, the business case as it were, well, we know there are a range of studies that have shown that teams are more productive when employees are engaged. And we list these in the report. Our survey analysis goes farther to show that companies led by executives who are focused on disability engagement, again, among that top 10%, are growing sales almost three times and profits four times faster than their peers. So I'm going to wrap it there, and I've included a link here to the study itself, but please reach out with any questions you may have. I've included my email here on the slide. So thank you so much to the Zero Project team for inviting me to participate here today. Thank you all for joining, and I greatly look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Lori, for um, this uh, great presentation, this great keynote, and the uh, interesting report and its findings. Um, I would like uh, to follow up with some questions that I prepared, as well as at, at some that I got from, uh, from the audience already. Uh, and we also have uh, Carola Rubia from Fundación Descubrimiento, who is still with us. So in the next 15 minutes or so, um, we hopefully have a, a fast-paced uh, uh, question and answer with you. Um, so um, I would like one more general question from the audience. Uh, there was a question, I think it's an interesting one. How do you define culture, corporate culture? Is there a concept behind using culture within your study or within Accenture in general? Yeah, so um, what I find is, you know, if we're talking broadly, right, about culture, you know, the acceptance levels um, are different, right, based on different cultures, but it's universal. It's a universal fact that individuals want to be their authentic selves at home, at work, in society. But what we know is that when you provide the most equal culture possible, that's what's desired. So. You know, Accenture's been delving into this concept of a culture of equality for several years now. And this is really the first time that we've done it with the lens of disability at, at such scale globally. Um, so while this study focuses on those factors, right, those eight factors that will influence an, employ an, an employee's engagement most and their ability to thrive, I think it's safe to say that you know, they also underpin a broader culture of equality. And, and when we define a culture of equality, it's one which has three fundamental things, right, that we talk about. The first is bold leadership. It's a diverse leadership team that sets, shares, measures equality and the targets openly, right? And we touch upon that when we talk about this, this existence of role models and how very empowering it is. And it has been for me personally, right? Um, uh, for the employee with disability to, to have those role models, to have those mentors. The second is providing that empowering environment. Um, one that uh, trusts employees, respects individuals, 
and offers that freedom to innovate, that freedom to be creative and to train and even work flexibly, which as Carla mentioned, right, so critical um, during, during these COVID times. Um, and then finally, it's, it's, it's a culture that, and an organization, right, that takes comprehensive action. So this is all about your policies, your practices, whether they're, you know, family friendly, um, supporting all people, regardless of background, gender, disability, et cetera. And yeah, it's truly bias free in attracting and retaining people. So I know it, it is mandatory. We all have to take um, my, uh, unconscious bias training. And that's just one example. I, I, um, back to you. Okay. Thank you, Laurie. A question from myself. Uh, um, when, when looking at the criteria, and this, these are really great ones, um, uh, like uh, flexibility, fair pay, uh, freedom to innovate, uh, this is uh, uh, arguably part of, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, best uh, employers or um, most admired employers in, in a general sense. Uh, some are looking more on general diversity, others are looking more on other uh, dimensions of being a good employer, would you say, and this is my question, that these companies uh, that tend to be leaders in the field of disability inclusion are the same, that are good and, and, and leading in a general uh, way of being a good employer, or are, are these different kind of organizations? Would there be some that are excellent in, uh, in disability inclusion, but not, not as good in, in a general way? Or is it more these kind of organizations that are are, are working, uh, if they're good in general diversity, then they're also good in disability inclusion. You know, I think that, um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that, you know, these are such important factors to be considering specifically um, when considering your employees with disabilities and what will help them to be more engaged, what will help them to be more, uh, to thrive more. And, and, and I am optimistic, actually, that that top 10% that um, surfaced, right, which are um, truly hitting the mark on each of these eight factors, um, and, and, and among that top 10% for disability engagement would also be, right, among that top 10%. Because again, these are broader factors, right? We did, we purposely did not delve into disability specific factors like accessibility, like um, accommodations, you will see ERGs, right? Support groups are included and that clearly is another big, you know, uh, disability specific factor that is so important. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it is, it is um, and I am optimistic that you would find similar companies, um, you know, uh, performing at, 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 at a high level. Right, if they're ticking the mark on these eight factors, so certainly. Okay. Uh, these were these were factors that also surfaced for our global study as well. Right, our culture of equality study. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. One more question from my side, then I would hand over to you, Carola. Uh, the question would be uh, coming from uh, from the chat. Uh, there are two that are related. Uh, the research was obviously done before COVID really kicked in. Uh, would the COVID nineteen situation have worsened things a lot? very much or a little, or is, are there still as much as opportunities and challenges as before? Um, it's a good question, right? Because you're right, we, we did conduct this prior and we did, we actually, during COVID, we had a survey, right, that we ran that um, allowed us to slice to um, uh, responses specific to employees with disabilities. Um, and, and from that study, we did find that um, the proportion of employees with disabilities who are confident in their job, in their income security, in their, right, and just their engagement, right, that fell during COVID. Um, and it was like the six months between, it was it was six months, August 2020, right, where this study was, was conducted. That fell from 73% globally to just 40%. Um, and I know with Carla on the phone, unfortunately, we did not have a cut for Chile, Chile, but um, we do show that for Brazil, those numbers are 66% and dropping to 31%. So clearly it's had an impact. Um, and again, that's around job income and security, but I would absolutely suspect that we would have seen an impact, right? But I think that again, going back to how organizations have increasingly embraced flexible um, remote working technologies, 
Um, I love what I'm seeing uh, and, and how prevalent the topic of accessibility and assistive technologies and you know accommodations has been in in the mainstream. So you know, again, I'm I'm I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think it would have had an impact. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the hard data, but we do have that data re related to job security and 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 income. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, over to you, Carola. Question from your side. Carola? Uh, do you want me do you want me to ask a question yes, to Lori? If you have one or a comment or yeah. if you don't have then I'm continuing. No, I I don't have any. Don't worry. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Then I'm continuing. Um Lorin, a, a question to you as a uh, as, a, as a leading uh, a member of a, of, a, of a consultancy, if there is a company who says, actually I'm, I'm not convinced, I've been part of the Zero Project Conference, I've, I've listened to many speeches, I've listened to Lori, I want to embark on this journey, I want to do better. Um, what would be your advice? What would, what would be the first steps to take uh, for someone who yeah. is currently motivated yeah. to, to start uh, this definitely long journey? How, how can someone in a larger company start this? Yeah. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I think um, clearly that individual, right, or that organization has taken a look at the gaps, right? Those massive perception versus reality gaps that we've unearthed and are quite eye opening, right? When you consider the um, employer perception and the reality and the lived experience of the employee with disability, whether they've disclosed or not, right? And of course, those gaps, they do differ between different countries, right? Again, 30 countries were included in our survey, um, but they're pretty consistent and alarming. And I think in order to address areas of improvement, organizations, in my opinion, you know, first seek to understand how your culture factors, how these specific culture factors start there, right? How they play out in your organization and specifically for your employees with disabilities. Of course, depending on local laws, um, privacy, et cetera, you know, you know, certainly consider ensuring that your, your people or your engagement related outreach, your discussions, whether that's manager to employee or you're running a survey, whatnot, you know, ensure that those conversations or instruments are including questions related to these eight factors, um, which, which we've unearthed that, that influence confidence, belonging, ability to thrive. And you can use these factors as a guide for that initial assessment and what you really need to be prioritizing and focusing on. But, you know, I have to mention, right, keep in mind that there are also tools. And one that comes to mind for me is the Disability Equality Index, which um, is run by Disability In and the AAPD, which is increasingly going global, right? But this can absolutely be used as well to help you benchmark where you stand vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, disability inclusion and engagement. But really through this study, we know there are gaps. We provide a bit of a blueprint, right, on how to address these gaps. We also know that there's a business case where organizations led by executives focused on disability engagement are growing sales, as you heard, at three times and profits at four times faster than their peers. Um, so, you know, again, I'm optimistic that more businesses will um, will take a look at this, um, will, ex will, will, you know, experience and, and acknowledge those gaps and do more. Yeah, uh, Laurie, I completely agree. So uh, one of my main takeaways from your uh, presentation is what you call this this gap of urgency need. Uh, so this gap between uh, the, the, the leaders and the, the major decision makers in a company and, and uh, uh, the need of urgency that uh, employees with disabilities feel. So I think this is definitely something uh, that could be a starting point, just doing this kind of research within the company and see where the gaps, how big this gap are in, in your company. Yeah? So that I think this could be an interesting starting point and this would also point out directly uh, where where to start. And so this could be a, this process of doing this research within the company could be an, an excellent kickoff point for uh, going in the right way. Would you, would you agree? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so um, this leads me to, to, the, to, to, the, to the final wrap-up. I have one question, Ka Michael. Yes, Carola, please come in. Thank you. Uh, Lori, I think the, the study that you have done is a wonderful and um, 
And well, the next time maybe Chile will be included, but never yes. mind. I mean, you now I know that uh, now that you will take us into account. And but uh, one of the things that we I was wondering maybe you you find some information while you were doing the research is regarding uh, the the inclusion is not something easy to understand. Obviously, not easy to um, to enthusiast uh, everyone. So what we have found that if the management, the top high management is not involved, anything that you try to do regarding inclusion is very difficult to, to do. So there is anything that you have found on your research that maybe will be interesting to share with the, with us and with the audience regarding that specific topic? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, you're absolutely right, right? You need to have the stakeholder, that senior top level, right, stakeholder support um, and visibility, right, um, in this space. Uh, it, 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 our own CEO, Julie Sweet, right, has said openly, Carla, right, that disability inclusion is really personal for her. She has said she has said that internally. She has said that externally, um, and has you know. So she shared, for example, um, in the World Economic Forum event. I think it was um, maybe one or two years ago, right? She was talking about our goals, our action plan, how we plan to measure our progress. Um, but she's also acknowledging that we have so much more to do. Um, and again, I was so excited for Accenture to step forward and sponsor such a robust study as this and really launch it on International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Showcase our stories, stories of our people, which I showed in the video, right, during the, um, during the presentation today. Um, and, and launch that and announce that and, and amplify that through social media like Twitter, for example. I, I think that it's, it's, it's that leadership, visibility, support, um, advocacy, but also the sharing of these people stories and, and, and these authentic points of view and the voices, right, around how we can continue to build that culture of equality and break down the barriers to drive inclusion. Um, but yeah, you know, absolutely, at the end of the day, we need to see more of that. And I think that there are activities underway, right? We have executives signing on and major global companies signing on to what Caroline Casey is doing with the, you know, and the WEF, right, with, with the Valuable 500. We have uh, the leaderboard uh, that surfaces through the Disability Equality Index as well. And we, we see a lot of action here, um, but, but we are all on a journey with this thing. Nobody has it perfect. I think you'll agree. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Laurie. I think we could not end this se session on a, on a better, on a more inspiring note uh, than, your, than, your, than your last two minutes. So thank you, Laurie. Thank you, for Carola, for staying with us. And uh, this concludes this great session. So thank you for all your participation. We continue at full hour. Thank you so much for having us.